Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Mara, Caroline, Deus, Dan, and Vicky for organizing a fantastic program of talks for GEM 2021 and for, for inviting Soph and I, Jen and me, to discuss some lessons that have been learned from the, uh, from the pandemic. Um, the last time Jen and I were in the same room was, was back in February 2020, which seems like a long time ago now, uh, uh, the launch of a, of, a, of a new malarian initiative funded by the Gates Foundation. Whose, whose goal is to enable malaria control programs and policy makers to use genetic data, integrate it with epidemiological data, and make more informed decisions about how to deploy next generation bed nets, how to coordinate the rotation of multiple insecticides used for IRS, how to maintain sustainable and effective anti-malarial drug treat, treatments, particularly in Southeast Asia, and how to target malaria control interventions for, for, for maximum impact. Uh, but um, within a few weeks of our project launch, it became apparent that, that, that COVID-19 was taking off worldwide. Uh, and so by March, we were in discussions with other research groups across the UK to think about how viral genome sequencing could help to fight the pandemic. And, and that led to the formation of COG UK, which is a consortium of 16 sequencing labs working closely with the, the NHS testing labs and the UK public health agencies. And within that, Sanger's role was to complement the regional sequencing labs uh, and serve as a, as a national sequencing hub. And our scientific operations team here at Sanger stood up a sequencing pipeline, initially aiming to process a thousand viral samples a day. And that seemed like an extremely large number at the time. It, it was a project that had a lot of volunteers from across the, the Sanger, uh, over 200 staff volunteered. So it was a big project involving the whole institute. Um, by April 2020, an extraordinary opportunity came up for Sanger to collaborate with a new uh, ne national network of COVID testing labs called the Lighthouse Labs. A and um, that offered the opportunity to establish a systematic framework for national genomic surveillance, because uh, these Lighthouse samples accounted for about 70% of confirmed cases across the UK with a broad geographical coverage. And, and, and most of the samples came from symptomatic individuals in the community as opposed to hospital admissions. So this gave uh, an opportunity for systematic uh, sampling across the whole country. But there were a, a bunch of very uh, daunting initial challenges. One was the logistics of shipping and, and handling uh, 300,000 samples per week. And those samples were just waste RNA from testing. They were both positives and negatives on the same plate. They had to be, the positives had to be cherry picked out of the plate. That was difficult in many senses. It needed robotics that we didn't have at the time. There was a lot of manual operation, but it was made worse by the fact that the shipments were arriving with very patchy sample metadata. So it was very slow to work out which samples to pick. And there was no easy way to get key epi metadata, such as sample time location. And this is where I'm very proud of the malaria gene team came in, in particular John Silito, Sonia Gonzalez, Christina Ariani, and Robert Marto, and, and with other members of Sanger, but took a lead in trying to put together a framework to deal with this avalanche of samples coming from the national testing network. And, and over the past year, we put together processes for handling on the order of half a million samples a week. And that involves sample shipments from labs across the UK, Scotland, uh, and England, and Northern Ireland, daily shipments of waste RNA samples left over from testing. And as well as those sample shipments, there's operational data flow of box manifests and plate maps and sample metadata flows coming from NHS Digital and Public Health in England. And they're all integrated into a, a a set of processes, pipelines, and delivery teams that uh, are working on sample receipt, sample cherry picking, library preparation, sequencing, and QC, and then uploading those data to the, uh, the CLIME cloud data infrastructure, which is the data uh, repository of the COG UK network, but also reporting directly to the Department of Health and Public Health England on variants of concern. Uh, and uh, over that time, we've we've been continually improving our processes. One of the challenges at the outset was that our time to um, 
are flashed to bang time from a, a song being tested to uploading data was over three weeks. But over the course of the year, we've narrowed that down to a week and our target is, is, is less than five days. That, that, that flash to bang is the total time from test to providing sequence data and variant calls to the public health agencies. It includes all the shipment of samples from around the UK, the cherry picking process of positive samples, the QC process and the integration of different data streams. So it's the end to end process. Uh, we've sequenced uh, over 300,000 uh, SARS-CoV-2 genomes here at Sanger, which is about 20% of the global total. Um, and uh, the key thing is that that now provides a framework for us to look across the UK and see what's happening in near real time. Uh, and we've, if you go to this website, COV-19 Sang at UK, you can see some visual analytics put together by Jeff Barrett's team in collaboration with, with Boris Gertzler at EBI and, and Theo Sanderson at Crick that gives a, a, a near real time representation of things happening here. So what we can see here is the spread of the so-called alpha variant or what was known formerly as the Kent or B117 variant across the UK. It's starting to expand in the, in the later part of last year uh, and really sort of taking off in the early months of this year and now starting to decline because of national lockdown and starting to be overtaken by a new variant, the Delta variant, which is spreading around the world. And this ability to see the spatial temporal spread of, of a virus and how different lineages are evolving within that spatial temporal spread gives us a huge amount of power to, to steer um, all sorts of interventions, to think about uh, lockdown, to think about how well vaccines are working. Um, it, it's, a, it's a game changer to have that type of spatial temporal representation. Now, what we've learned over the last year is uh, that genomic epidemiology is a co-evolutionary process, that the viral genome is evolving, it's acquiring variation, it's evolving, but so are the public health use cases of, for viral epidemiology. So in, in the early phases of the epidemic, a lot of focus was on analyzing where outbreaks came from uh, and where super spreading events were happening. But of course now there's a much more attention on managing variants of concern. As, as we've evolved a, a better surveillance capability, that's shaping our pu public health actions, along of course with other things like importantly vaccines. And as those public health actions change, our lockdown policy, our vaccines and other interventions, that in turn is affecting how the virus is evolving. So all of these things are working together in, in a dynamic way. Um, the, the story of COVID evolution so far is interesting. It started out as a virus, which appeared to have a relatively low mutation rate, and there wasn't much variation in the population. And, and many people felt that genomic epidemiology was rather boring. But progressively, um, through the vast numbers of the virus, the vast population size of the virus, a lot of variation has accumulated in the population, mostly neutral. But early on, we started to see some evolutionary selection of variants with increased transmissibility, the, the D614G spike mutation in particular. But then, as we know, at the end of last year, the alpha variant appeared to start off in Kent and spread through the UK and the rest of the world. And more recently, the Delta variant, which seems to be significantly more transmissible than the alpha variant. And of course, the worrying thing next is, is will there be evolutionary selection of vaccine escape mutants? That's the thing that we're going to be watching out for in year, over the rest of this year and for many years to come. So what are the key messages from all this? Well, one is that sequencing is just part of genomic surveillance. It's all very well to be able to sequence a sample in 24 hours, but what matters is what's the time between that case emerging in the community to that individual getting tested, to that test being processed, to that sample getting to the sequencer. And then most importantly, that sequencing information being integrated with other source of epi data that makes it useful to public health agencies. And the front end and the back end of that process take a very long time and they don't happen unless there's very close integration with public health agencies. And public health agencies are busy people and they're only want to do that if the genomic surveillance is seen to be useful. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg there. The second thing is that open data is empowering. We know that, and it's been vital in the fight against um, COVID-19 in the sense that seeing where problems are rising around the world 
being prepared for importation of samples that might be dangerous for, from, from different parts of the world. Uh, um, but not only is open data important, we're learning so is longitudinal surveillance data. Longitudinal surveillance is really boring until something happens and then it's vital. So for example, it's been vital in understanding which variants are more transmissible. And finally, use cases evolve that uh, initially the use cases uh, may seem to be about uh, transmission networks. Later on, they may be more about um, understanding evolution of new variants. And, and, and that is a dynamic, uh, a, a dynamic process. So the important thing is not to be too, too dogmatic, but rather be, to be prepared for the uh, unexpected. Now, back to malaria, although COVID has been very disruptive in many ways, it's, it's raised awareness of challenges of controlling infectious disease and how genomic epidemiology can help to overcome some of those challenges. Sustainable malaria control and elimination needs different countries to share genomic surveillance data on parasites and mosquitoes with the right governance structures and well-curated data resources. It, it needs uh, surveillance data to be translated into actionable information tailored for specific use cases in control and elimination. It requires controlled programs to have access to the services and technical support they need to collect surveillance data and use it in their decision making. Um, many parts, of, many, many people in this conference are working on different parts of the puzzle. And in our panel session, it would be great if we, if we can discuss how we can all work together more effectively to crack this incredibly tough problem. I just want to say a, a few brief words about some things that are happening in the Malarian network that contribute to that effort. One is, of course, releasing well curated open data resources. And at this meeting, uh, Alistair and Chris have talked about recent data releases for Anopheles genome variation and insecticide resistance. And Richard and Jacob have talked about some forthcoming data releases for the plasmodium genome uh, and for drug resistance. And I encourage you to, to look at the Nerogen website and see what, what we have now, and what's coming up in, 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 in the next few months. Um, another really important thing, of course, is the, uh, the, the development of effective tools for amplicon sequencing that was vital in fighting uh, COVID-19. The Arctic protocol was, was, was fantastic for many groups around the world in getting started. I'm, very proud to say that our colleagues in Ghana, led by Gordon Owandari, uh, using, uh, using uh, the Arctic Protocol, but also then using systems that we'd helped to build for, for malaria amplicon sequencing, they were amongst the first groups in Africa to get out COVID-19 surveillance data. One of the things we've done in Malaria is, is set up a, an amplicon toolkit user group, groups around the world in, in Ghana, in, in Gambia, Tanzania, Mali, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, who are are working, who are using the, the tool, the Amplicon toolkits we have developed at Malariagen. But of course, there are many other groups around the world who are building fantastic Amplicon sequencing tools. And it would be great to discuss in the panel session what, what's the best forum for all of these groups who are developing resources and who are using these resources to get together so we, we, we synergize to maximum effect. Now, when we hold uh, GEM conferences at Inkston, um, Typically, the home team uh, enjoys firstly greeting you all, but also uh, taking you out to the Red Lion and laying on some additional amusements. And I'm sorry we aren't able to do that this year, but we're really looking forward to, in the post-COVID world, of meeting up again, working with you all again, uh, 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 and also importantly, thinking about how we can set up a GEM meeting in Africa. Um, and then, um, Finally, I want to just reflect on how our network, our Malaysia network, was, was conceived. It was it started off uh, at a, a meeting in Accra in January 2004, uh, and uh, it brought together delegates from across Africa. And the key question was, how could we uh, set up a system for equitable data sharing of human genetic data, because at that time there was great interest, uh, particularly in how you could do large multi-center studies of human genetic susceptibility to malaria. And together we hammered out many of the principles that have underlay, that underlie uh, our current network. Um, I want to just pay tribute to two of our founders. Um, firstly, the great Ogobara Dumbo, who did so much to establish the, the current generation of malaria 
researchers in Africa and to promote the, the, the cause of genomic epidemiology. And it's very sad that Ogo died before he could see all the fruits of his efforts. I, I also want to pay a, a personal tribute to Kurt Rocket, who's, who's very well known to many of you as a mentor, a teacher, a, a total technical support package. Uh, for all things to do with malaria and genetics, and, and, and indeed as a friend. Um, Kirk has just retired from the University of Oxford, um, and I want to say to Kirk, on behalf of all of us, happy retirement, Kirk, and thank you so much for all you've done. And then finally, I just want to reflect on the fact that when we started off uh, Malaria Gen uh, 17 years ago, um, it was not possible to genome sequence a uh, a parasite out of a clinical sample. It wasn't possible to genome sequence a malaria mosquito. Uh, and there were many other things that we couldn't do back then. And, and I want to say that even though the challenges of the next 17 years are daunting, how we're actually going to put genomic surveillance into practice, uh, I would like to say a lot has happened in the last 17 years. A great deal will happen in the next 17 years. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to our future meetings face to face so we can work out how we're together we're going to make that happen and put genomic epidemiology into practice for malaria. Thank you.